Good evening and welcome to AWARE on the Air. Our program is presented by members and friends of AWARE, a local peace group. AWARE is an acronym for anti-war, anti-racism effort. I'm Carl Estabrook. AWARE was established 13 years ago, after the 9-11 attacks, by citizens of Champaign-Urbana who realized that the U.S. government would use those crimes to justify its already long-standing attempts to exercise military control over the Middle East. Mideast gas and oil are needed by America's economic competitors in Europe and Asia, and control of them gives the U.S. an advantage over China, Germany, and other countries, including Russia. The U.S. invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq and the ongoing American wars throughout the Middle East are not a matter of fighting terrorism. They're about imperial control, just like invasions by Germany and Japan at the beginning of World War II. Germany said it was stopping Polish terrorism against German citizens, and Japan said it was stopping Chinese bandits. Today, President Obama is bombing Iraq and Syria, and he continues to send drones to kill people in Southwest Asia and East Africa. Obama is the fourth president in a row to bomb Iraq. He's now bombed more countries, eight of them, than George Bush did. He only bombed six. It's hard to understand how the president who came into office promising hope and change is hated around the world, but look at the military actions that Americans don't know about, but the rest of the world does. Obama's killing is called fighting terrorism because terrorism is the name the U.S. gives to the armed resistance, which of course can be vicious and brutal, to the generation's long U.S. invasion of the region. Ashton Carter, Obama's new Secretary of Defense, is an advocate for even greater U.S. military attacks on the axis of evil, Iraq, North Korea, and Iran. A good article in the Salon uh, website uh, refers to Ashton Carter as, quote, a fan of blowing things up. Why the Defense Secretary nominee was ready to restart the Korean War. He actually suggested during the uh, Obama administration's dealings with North Korea that the U.S. attack North Korea. He's for committing, in other words, what the Nuremberg Tribunal called the supreme international crime, launching aggressive war. After the Nuremberg trials at the end of World War II, we executed Nazis for that. But Carter will probably escape hanging, as Hamlet says, because his boss, President Obama, has already committed the supreme international crime several times over. From the time he ran for the Senate, Obama has supported the possibility of a preemptive attack on Iran as well. In 2004, the Chicago Tribune wrote, quote, the United States should not rule out military strikes to destroy nuclear production sites in Iran, Obama said, having, quote, having a radical Muslim theocracy in possession of nuclear weapons is worse than US the U.S. launching some missile strikes into Iran. Now, it's, uh, the new Secretary of Defense is a partisan of that policy. After vowing to end the combat mission in Afghanistan, Obama has now secretly extended America's longest war. Most Americans believe that the U.S. is withdrawing from Afghanistan, but we aren't. The Obama administration lies about what it's really doing in the Middle East and how they're trying to end the wars. The media, owned by big business, help them to mislead the only enemy the U.S. government really fears, the American public, who made the government end a similar war in Vietnam two generations ago. We'll try to give a better account of that war tonight with commentaries by Ron Zoak, yearning to breathe free, Karen Aram on the Senate CIA report, Karen Evans-Levy on opposition to murder in Champaign and, see you, and uh, the headline, as a matter of fact, have you seen that I, of the, uh, I did see on the it, News yes. Gazette? The News Gazette, which does not normally cover demonstrations, has a, a front page picture about the demonstration on campus uh, last uh, uh, yesterday. And uh, we'll hear about also uh, student demonstrations at, Champ at a Champaign High School. Uh, and uh, further comments from David Johnson. Resistance from Ferguson to Kabul. Excellent. Yes. 
will begin with Ronzo, yearning to breathe, right? Or yearning to breathe free. Yes, well, it's a uh, kind of uh, uh, <clears throat> comment on what it says on the Statue of Liberty, uh, the huddled masses yearning to breathe free, and then what, what we heard from the um, a gentleman killed by the police in uh, uh, Staten Island, uh, I can't breathe, 11 times, but uh, they choked him to death anyway. And of course, what we're hearing from the right-wing media is that uh, he did it to himself. Uh, he was uh, obese and uh, had certain medical problems, and he was selling unlicensed cigarettes and so on. So a he, capital offense. Right. He broke the law, and so therefore the Judge implication is he deserved to right. be killed. So uh, what I really want to talk about <coughs> is uh, um, the Senate uh, torture report. The, uh, Senate commissioned a report of some 600 pages, according to some sources. 6,000, I think the final one is. Yeah, yeah. but the uh, um, executive summary, as it's called, of some 480 pages, uh, uh, now being heavily uh, redacted, is due to be released uh, today, which uh, uh, describes, to some extent, uh, the torture operations carried out by the CIA uh, after 9-11 uh, and uh, throughout the uh, Bush years, apparently. So uh, the New York Times report today says that uh, the Senate torture report condemns the CIA for deception and brutality. A scathing report released by the Senate Intelligence Committee on Tuesday found that the Central Intelligence Agency routinely misled the White House and Congress about information it obtained from the detention and interrogation of terrorist suspects, and that its methods were more brutal than the CIA acknowledged, either to Bush administration officials or the public. So uh, this is leaving room for uh, deniability, of course. Uh, uh, the uh, Bush administration officials can say, uh, well, we didn't know about it. They uh, lied to us. But uh, former Vice President Cheney is uh, still saying it was all legal and uh, it was justified. So uh, uh, I guess some views differ. The long delayed report, which took five years to produce and is based upon more than six billion internal agency documents, is a sweeping indictment of the CIA's operation and oversight of a program carried out by agency officials and contractors in secret prisons around the world in the years after the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. It also provides a macabre accounting of some of the grisliest techniques that the CIA used to torture and imprison terrorism suspects. Detainees were deprived of sleep for as long as a week and were sometimes told that they would be killed while in American custody. With the approval of the CIA's medical staff, some CIA prisoners were subjected to medically unnecessary rectal feeding or rectal hydration, a technique that the CIA's chief of interrogation described as a way to exert total control over the detainee. CIA medical staff members described the waterboarding of Khalil Sheikh Mohammed, the chief planner of the September 11th attacks, as a series of near drownings. Um, the, what used to be called the Chinese water torture was used hundreds of times on these uh, people, but uh, this became a point of contention. Uh, since torture was uh, against the law, they had to re uh, rename it uh, enhanced interrogation. And indeed, the uh, New York Times, for a long while, refused to call torture torture uh, because that would amount to taking sides in a uh, policy debate. So now the warnings uh, are coming from uh, a number of people in the uh, administration and the former administration. Uh, AP report, American embassies, military units, and other U.S. interests are bracing for possible security threats related to Tuesday's planned release of a report on the CIA's harsh interrogation techniques, the White House says. The report from the Senate Intelligence Committee will be the first public accounting of the CIA's use of torture on al-Qaeda detainees held in secret facilities in Europe and Asia over the, uh, in the years after the September 11, 2001 terror attacks. The committee is expected to release a 280-page document, uh, executive summary of the more than 6,000-page report compiled by the Democrats 
on the panel. Quoting, there are, some there are some indications that the release of the report could lead to greater risk than is proposed to U.S. facilities and individuals uh, all around the world. White House spokesman Josh Earnest said Monday, the administration has taken the prudent steps to ensure that the proper security measures, uh, precautions are in place at the U.S. facilities around the globe. So uh, uh, we're getting lots of uh, warnings then about the terrible things that might happen if this is uh, made uh, public. Of course, the other people in those countries know about it, but uh, Americans, for the most part, don't, and will be inclined, inclined to uh, uh, deny it. Uh, they'll say, well, you're just biased, or you're anti-American, or, or something. So uh, uh, the problem seems to be that we have, as general, generally as Americans, a devout and simple faith in the application of killing and torture to uh, achieve uh, our national goals. And uh, we're not ready to give up on it. So uh, they can maintain deniability of a sort as long as the, it's not officially admitted by the American government uh, what they've been doing. The report uh, has been heavily redacted, I understand. Uh, no names are given, and including the uh, locations of the torture rooms where these operations were uh, carried out. Some apparently were at Guantanamo, others in uh, Poland, and others besides that in various places. But uh, that's not being uh, admitted uh, at the present time. So. Uh, uh, I, this sets me to wondering sometimes, is there anything that the uh, Gestapo or the KGB or the Stasi ever did that uh, has not been done by uh, official agencies of the United States government? Uh, so if you can think of something, let me know. The line will be, well, uh, uh, they did more of it. Well, uh, that may be true, but uh, there's no difference in principle from what's uh, been done. So uh, again, uh, tell me if you think that there is uh, uh, some major crime that has been committed by the CIA or the FBI or whatever that was, uh, that was uh, uh, not, uh, I should have said it the other way around, right. done by the uh, uh, Nazis, the <clears throat> Gestapo, the KGB, or uh, Stasi that's not been done by the FBI. Uh, they seem uh, remarkably morally equivalent. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Ron. You're watching Aware on the Air. Uh, we'll go to uh, Karen Aram with some, yeah. I think, some more comments on the torture <laughs> yeah. report. Yeah. Yes, I was watching, uh, it, watching it intermittently while Diane Feinstein was uh, making her report mm -hmm. on CNN. <clears throat> and of course, what I picked up on the blip across the screen that was so, pro you know, <laughs> important. Uh, given that CNN had already interviewed Cheney, Bush, you know, whatever, was the fact uh, on the on the blip on the screen that uh, they knew nothing about it. Rumsfeld included Colin Powell. They were never informed of any of this. I know nothing. And yeah. then even yeah. afterwards, afterwards. Um, I think Ashley uh, was the commentator. Uh, she brought Fareed Zakaria on to make his comments. And the one thing Where he focused him, on yeah. was, wow, this, you know, this looks like it's a uh, rogue CIA uh, program. Yeah, yeah. And really kept you know, promoting this rogue CIA uh, program. And I thought, wow. Mm -hmm. So this whole, whole blue about the CI Senate report and, you know, Marines, thousands of Marines on uh, high alert around the world. It's all about whitewashing the administration. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because anything that we read about, I mean, we've heard this before, you know, we, we've heard a lot of this before, but any of the books that deal with activities that the CIA was involved with, Involved in, and it goes way back before Eisenhower. Uh, let's see, Eisenhower, Truman. I mean, it goes way back. Their activities, they were always, maybe it was a rubber stamp, 
but they were always approved. They always received approval from the White House. Yes. And, and that is documented in books. And uh, there have been no lawsuits <laughs> against the authors. So um, I, I feel like, oh, here we go again, another whitewash. And of course, they keep trying to give the impression that, you know, the CIA, I saw another speaker, a former <coughs> CIA analyst or something on CNN yesterday that all of this took place pre-2009 and it's all going to change now and yeah. uh, never again. I'm like, yeah, right, we heard that before. <laughs> So that's my comment on that. Thank yeah. you. Well, the higher whitewash is that of the black president. Yeah, right? we've learned some things about how to maintain deniability, as right. Ronald Reagan taught us to say. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about uh, how these things play out on the local scene. Karen Evans Levy about uh, some demonstrations in Champaign Urbana on the uh, uh, way in which uh, uh, the war has come home with uh, American <coughs> police. Yeah, so there have been several demonstrations in Champaign-Urbana. Um, the Ferguson um, grand jury result came out one day, and the next day we had a demonstration on Main Street in Urbana in front of the courthouse in between the jail and the courthouse. And, um, <clears throat> and we ended up uh, actually blocking the street so that traffic could not go through intentionally. That was our intention because the jail and the and the courthouse are actually separated by the street, so we blocked off the street. And we were going in circles, and I'm just going to mention two incidents that I had with cars there because the, this relates to the Centennial High School situation. There were two cars that were uh, kind of interested in going through the area. First of all, they didn't, the first car did not realize that this was going to be an ongoing thing and that, the car, that we were not going to open up and let the cars through, they just thought people were crossing the street, a large number of people were crossing the street, but we ended up doing a circle. And so I went up to the, the driver of the first car and I said to him, he was an African American, large African American man, and I said, um, you can turn around and go the other direction and get there your, another way. And he said, oh, no, um, I, heard, I heard it was a demonstration about uh, the Ferguson result and my name is Mike Brown. And I said, oh, Okay, and he said, I want to stay here and just soak this in because, you know, this is about me. It's really mm -hmm. close to home. And I said, you can stay as long as you want. Can I give you a hug? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I reached in and gave him a hug, and um, he was very, very nice. And eventually his car did turn around. But right behind him was a police car that was trying to get through, too. And um, he, the police officer probably, well, I know that he saw me hug the person in front of him, and so he knew that it wasn't like a, you know, something that he needed to jump out of the car and take care of. Um, anyway, so that's, so we have interactions with cars all the time. Um, it is civil disobedience to actually block down a street, um, but we do have rights as protesters, as demonstrators, for f our First Amendment rights, and, um, and to be, close to streets and on public property and say our, have our voices heard. Um, and, and it is civil disobedience to actually block down the street, but the First Amendment rights are a little bit more important than traffic, um, is a quote from de Blasio, uh, the mayor of New York. Um, and I completely agree with him. That's democracy in action, Karen. Yeah. And cars can always turn around and go somewhere else. They don't mm -hmm. have to. They don't have to try to go through the, the where we are. The second car that happened during that, after the Ferguson event, um, again at the Main Street and the courthouse, there was a car that was coming through on the other side, and she was pushing her way through. She, want, she was inching forward. Like she would come five feet forward, and then she'd come a foot forward. And um, she was looking for a break in the, the moving circle of people. And so what I did was I, I went and stood in front of her car because I was not going to move and she could not get a break if I was actually standing there. And she kept inching forward until she was literally, you know, that far away from hitting me. And she was trying to, she was very angry. You could see she was yelling and screaming in her car. And I said, you can turn around. You know, there's a street right there. You can take that street. 
And um, she's like, I'm coming through. And um, anyway, so you get very, very angry people when you demonstrate. Um, and eventually, two other people joined me and stood in front of her car. And she realized she wasn't going to get through and that she wasn't actually going to kill me. So she turned around and did go the other direction. And that was um, a couple weeks ago. We've had incidents with other vehicles, a vehicle that drove up on North Prospect, um, up onto the, t onto the sidewalk in order to hit demonstrators. Um, we've had people throw, one time we were out with a, there were a bunch of uh, Muslim people out with us one time, and a car threw some garbage, not at everybody. They picked the, the one Muslim family, and in, in particular the child, <coughs> and threw the garbage at the child, out the window. Um, so we have people yelling at us all the time, like, get a job, which makes no <laughs> yeah, sense to me. Right. That's, that's right. the most ridiculous thing. <laughs> we retirees particularly like right. that. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> and it's usually a Saturday. And also, these people mm -hmm. driving down the streets aren't at their jobs <laughs> either. So. Um, so OK, the incident at Centennial High School. Centennial High School <coughs> students organized an inside peace demonstration, a die-in, and then it moved outside. They, the media that they had contacted uh, could not come into the school, so they actually went out to meet them outside. And um, they spilled out onto the street during this, and a driver drove into the crowd of minors in a school zone and um, did hurt some people. And one of the kids uh, hit the windshield to try to stop her, and um, the windshield was cracked, not broken like the the News Gazette reports it. And then the ch so the the child, the teenager, was taken into custody. Um, and later released when the video came out. That so until the video came out, the police were prosecuting the young people in a school zone that were driven into by a vehicle. Okay, this really bothers me. So there was a board meeting last night and the public came out. Um, there were over 21 people who spoke at the, the school board meeting yesterday in support. Every single one of them was in support of <coughs> the principal, the teachers, the students, and, um, and asking the school board not to punish the student and, um, or the students and not to lock down the schools and things like that. And there will be a demonstration to, oh, I'm sorry, it'll be earlier today, um, Tuesday um, at Central High School. And it will be an outside demonstration at 3.30. And um, I plan to be there too to, to stop traffic if they need it and to make sure that nobody is hit by a car. Thank you, Karen. Uh, you're watching Aware on the Air. Uh, we'll go to our friend David Johnson for some comments. Okay, yes, uh, it's some really interesting times we live in now. Um, you know, it's just really unfortunate that it takes tragedies uh, like the uh, killing of Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, and uh, the 12-year-old boy in Cleveland just recently mm -hmm. by the police uh, to get people to finally start fighting back because, you know, the, the problems we're facing in this country uh, have been going on for a while now. And I think that they're just getting, they're not getting any better, they're getting worse. I mean, it, this is the, the increasing militarization of the police, uh, the police uh, being uh, acting more and more like they're in, a, in an occupied country instead of being partners of the community. Uh, we're seeing this trend spreading. Uh, it's getting worse. More and more unarmed civilians are being killed and uh, African-American uh, young men are taking the brunt of it uh, statistically. I mean, if you look at the percentage of uh, African Americans, the population uh, compared to the other ethnic groups in the population, I mean, it's just unbelievable. It's three times what their uh, percentage numbers are in the population uh, that are being um, killed by the police. And uh, this is, you know, these incidents are not unrelated. Uh, unfortunately, this whole increase in the militarization of the police is part of policy, the same policy uh, that invaded Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the same policies that are trying to push more free trade agreements on us to lower our, our, our further our deteriorating standard of living. 
Um, and th this is all tied in. Uh, basically, the American people have lost control uh, of their governments, and it, this is the, the interests of the American people are not being served, either in domestic policy or in foreign policy. Uh, the, inter the people that are controlling both our domestic and foreign policy, uh, the lawmakers uh, who get elected with corporate, uh, for the most part, corporate campaign contributions, uh, have a totally different agenda than what the majority of the American people want. And we need to keep that in mind. And civil disobedience is breaking the law. There is no doubt there. But the thing is, is when uh, elections don't work, when uh, the courts don't work, uh, when other uh, mechanisms don't work, then what are citizens supposed to do? Um, and this is, if there hadn't have been civil disobedience during the 1960s um, in the South, uh, the civil rights uh, laws that uh, were eventually passed, barring discrimination, uh, would never have happened. Make no mistake about it. Nothing has ever changed in this country, or in fact the world, uh, without some kind of struggle. People in power do not concede power without a demand and uh, actually be enforced to make the change. Uh, you saw this in the abolitionist movement. You saw this in, this, uh, in the women's uh, suffrage movement to gain the vote. Uh, you saw this especially in the labor movement uh, going back to the 1880s and uh, you know, reoccurring on and off through the 1930s in which workers illegally occupied factories in order to get uh, decent wages and benefits. So this is as American as apple pie. Um, it's just unfortunate that uh, the ruling class in this country uh, hasn't learned any lessons from it. I mean, they basically, uh, their greed has overridden all of their, uh, any kind of compassion they might have, or logic for that matter. I and mean, this continues on to uh, climate um, change and uh, what they're doing to our environment. Um, frankly, people, uh, the, the future of the world um, depends on us getting out and demanding, and if necessary, breaking the law, nonviolently, but uh, doing what we need to do to make our elected officials and the people that are behind them uh, change our, the policy that they're, they're in, uh, forcing down our throats. So I guess um, you know, we're seeing the resistance, and this is a worldwide thing. We're having re there's resistance from Ferguson to Kabul uh, to, to Greece uh, to uh, other parts of the world, the Ukraine, in which a small group of people um, that are, have insatiable greed, are willing to push us to the absolute limits, uh, both for our, our economic security, um, the, the climate we have to live in, uh, and uh, ultimately uh, risking uh, world war for it. Uh, and it's just insane, and uh, we need to stop it. Uh, the mayor just walked through, and I just want to mention, uh, <clears throat> the mayor of Urbana just walked through, and that reminded me that the police review board is one of the things that um, they say that we have, you know, a way to to speak out of against uh, police doing bad things or um, inappropriately. Mm -hmm. And the police review board in Urbana is basically has its hands tied and cannot actually do anything. Right. And um, so even the cities that are very progressive and very, you know, let's do a police review board can keep that from actually working. Yes. Um, Champaign does not have a police review board. I live in Champaign and we've been working on one for a long time. We thought, yeah, sure, maybe Urbana will start one and then Champaign will have pressure to do it because they'll see us how, but Urbana has done a really, really, really rotten job at um, allowing that to happen. That's it's, a very important point. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's clear that one of the things that's needed uh, is uh, police review boards with teeth. Uh, uh, police review boards that have the power of initiative, yep. that is of taking up cases on their own, yep. and secondly that have the simple power of dismissal. I mean not, not, not a, uh, 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 a paralegal process at all, but just a board that's, I mean, if, you, uh, if, if you're working for Kraft and you do something uh, you, uh, in your work life that uh, uh, gets in the way of the goals of Kraft, you won't be working there for much longer. Right. But in the police business, apparently, uh, the notions are that, uh, well, we have to go through all sorts of legal uh, uh, machinations in order to uh, remove someone from the police department. A police review board has got to be able to do that. And 
and to that, as you say quite rightly, none of this is true of the Urbana Police Review Board. And they even need to, they don't even have subpoena power. Yes, They can't exactly. even ask for people to, to, like a police officer to actually appear before them and tell their, you know. And not, they, not only that, they can't even take up a case on their right, own. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very yeah. true. They have to wait for someone to complain about it and then actually it has to go through the police to right. get to them. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's, the whole thing is, is quite ridiculous. Um, yeah. There's another point there that, that, that if there are indeed any investigations of, of behavior by the police in Urbana and other local jurisdictions, uh, that's often carried out by other police bodies. Yes. yes. And that's mm -hmm. quite wrong. Yes. Uh, right. And uh, 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 in, the, in many cases, the tie-ups between uh, prosecutors and the local police are very great. Yeah. Uh, in Urbana or in Champaign County, that's particularly true. Yes. Uh, and therefore, it seems to me that We've got to, sort of, on a local level, we've got to insist on control of the police uh, and control of the police outside these uh, barriers that have been set up by the police to protect themselves. And the reasons that we don't have any prosecutions, uh, we don't have any removal of police officers uh, on the basis of uh, uh, incidents that uh, occur all the time. And even the police officers within, and there are good police officers. I will, I will tell you right now that I know that there are some very good police officers. They're afraid to even um, report on other police officers because there will be no disciplinary action happen from the bad cop to the bad cop. And so then that bad cop can actually do whatever they want to the good cop. And so there's, it's, it's a really, really bad situation. And I'm just going to point out that um, murder is illegal, but yet police officers can do it without being tried for it. Very rarely. You know, where there's a will, there's a way. That's the bottom line here. Richmond, California is a perfect case in point. Uh, mm -hmm. Richmond is a little larger than Champaign-Urbana, and uh, about uh, six, uh, seven years ago, uh, they had a total change in city government there. It was a combination of Greens and Progressive Democrats who, who got elected to the uh, uh, city council and the mayor's office. And they basically, from the day one, I mean, Richmond was uh, very uh, predominantly poor, um, uh, community, uh, heavily polluted by Chevron oil facilities, uh, and the uh, little slightly more, I think it's like around 60% of the uh, population is either uh, African American or uh, Latino. Um, and there was a complete turnaround. I mean, uh, crime was rampant there, but uh, with the hiring of a new, um, a very careful hiring of a new police chief uh, and certain measures put in by the city government, including a civilian t police review board that actually had subpoena power uh, and conviction power uh, as far as dismissal, uh, they've had, I think, uh, only one fatal shooting uh, by a police officer in the last uh, three years, and that was a, uh, a, a person that was uh, had a gun, and there were witnesses uh, to that effect. So uh, prior to that, though, the, uh, Richmond uh, was pretty typical of a lot of other cities in which there was a lot of uh, shootings of uh, unarmed uh, uh, minority youth. And uh, so that's the bottom line is where there is a will, there's a way. And to try to, you know, put up some kind of a superficial facade and say you've done something is just uh, typical uh, uh, liberal politics is done in America all the time. And it, it, it accomplishes nothing. Uh, it just, they, people, you know, it's basically a mechanism for somebody to pretend that they've done something when nothing's changed. This is a national problem that has to be addressed on the local level, too. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, in the United States, uh, in the last year for which statistics are provided by the FBI, uh, there were 409 police murders, uh, police killings, uh, according to the FBI. Now, it's probably a terrible undercount, given the way they, they do it. But it's, an interest, it's interesting to compare that with uh, other countries, uh, other countries that otherwise are like us. In Germany, in Japan, and in Great Britain, uh, which together have about the same population as the United States, I mean, well, the three of them together have a population equal to that of the United States, uh, there were in the same period a total of three killings by police. Now, that disparity has to be taken as an indication of something that's going on in this society. And one of the things that's going on in this society is a... Um, uh, 
activity from the top do down, from the federal government, the Department of Homeland Security, encouraging the formation of fusion centers of local police groups, precisely to get the police groups out of the control of the local political authorities. If the Champaign police do, and if the Champaign political authorities do say we want a police review board, uh, the response is no, no, the police have uh, a, a, a foot in the local fusion center, the police have rights under their uh, union agreements and so forth. That means that the attempt by the local political organizations to control those police uh, uh, come to nothing. Uh, that's got to stop, and we've got to stop that on the local level, because it certainly is the case that um, uh, the uh, form of policing that we are seeing to our horror in this country does come from the top down. Uh, Max Blumenthal, a very interesting reporter who's written an extremely good book about what's happened in Israeli society recently, a book called Goliath, which is very much worth uh, your attention, um, wrote an article three years ago about the way in which American police were being um, uh, Israelized, is, uh, sorry, uh, he had a slightly better term for it, uh, but he was talking about the fact that the um, uh, American police uh, organizations across the country, from big cities to small uh, uh, communities, were being uh, sent for training in Israel and that the Israeli uh, attempts to control their dissident population uh, were being transferred to uh, uh, U.S. police departments with the notion that the uh, uh, situation in American um, cities and towns was also a situation of occupation. Now we've seen that pay off, it seems to me, in these uh, recent horrible cases, uh, and we ha even have from the federal government now, from the Department of Justice, an account of the Cleveland Police Department of how these Israeli techniques, and that's exactly what Blumenthal describes them as being, uh, uh, are working out, working out in practice. The war that the U.S. is carrying on in the Middle East comes home through our police departments and the control of our own dissident populations, often communities of color. The only way that can be countered is on the local level, and that's what we've got to do. You're watching Aware on the Air. Uh, comments on things that have been uh, said so far this evening are in order? Well, the Israelis have acquired something of a reputation globally for being the experts in techniques of crowd control and uh, anti-personnel weapons. And that's what uh, being imported and has been for several years uh, by American police departments under the encouragement of the federal government. Second comment, if there uh, is a way wherever there's a will, why isn't there a will? Because there are a lot of white people who don't understand that there is a difference that um, they go through their lives not understanding what it's like not to be white. Well, Karen, I don't think it's just white. I mean, uh, let's take a look at the state of West Virginia, which has been reduced to almost a third world country. Uh, West Virginia has very high cr violent crime rates, a lot of uh, drug activity, um, but you don't hear about this. Uh, and, uh, but of course, whenever there's crime reports by the corporate media, they always seem to focus on uh, urban centers uh, with uh, predominantly African-American uh, populations. Um, this is, I mean, the fact is that African-American youths have been targeted, I mean, disproportionately, I mean, speaks volumes about the ingrained racism in this country. Uh, but the, the general um, attitudes of the police as far as how they respond uh, to uh, um, just minor instances sometimes is basically, I mean, it's obvious that they're being encouraged to use overwhelming force uh, and to uh, intimidate people. I mean, they w want you to be afraid, to be a very afraid, to come out to a protest, to even talk, if you yes. talk back uh, mm -hmm. even to some law enforcement officer that you risk having uh, your life taken from you. Uh, this is policy. I don't. It's not accidental, and it's not just um, you know uh, involving black people. It's all people of yes. that are in poverty uh, that are trying to fight back the only way they know how. Sometimes it's only surviving the only way know, they know how. But you are right. There are many people, uh, and I would uh, maybe say it could be possibly uh, some people uh, say very well off uh, suburban people that are uh, are also of non-european heritage that uh, you know feel like that yeah well you know uh, things are just out of control and the police need to do their job um, so I think it really comes a lot down to uh, um, you know class in the society it is it is really a class mm -hmm. issue yeah um, 
And um, I don't even know where to begin on that. But uh, basically, there aren't any more black people using drugs than there are white people using right. drugs percentage right. wise. And it's just that they will let the white person off or with a minimal thing or not charge them. Um, and so the, so even people here in town that I've been talking to, they're like, oh, but you know, in those black neighborhoods it, or the poor neighborhoods, that's where all the crime is happening. I'm like, it's happening right across the street from you. Look at that. Um, <laughs> because there was a, you know, there's a, there was a house over in, um, in a rich area of Urbana and they knew there were drugs being made over there and they kept reporting it and the police never went over there until they had enough proof that, and, and could actually, you know, storm the house. But they, the whole community, the whole neighborhood, very well off neighborhood, mostly retired people, um, knew it was happening for the longest time and and yet and right. and right across and, you know it was their neighbors their neighbors would actually go over to get drugs from them and so there was there was use and there was making drugs but it was in a good neighborhood and so nothing happened for years before and it was also a good family that was a good community family that was we, we should also mention that, that, that this occurs in the context of the war on drugs right. uh, yeah. which yes. itself <clears throat> has always been a license for the police right. uh, and for social control the war on drugs has to be abolished it has to be just put put off the boards across the, uh, entirely uh, because it is being used as it uh, as you suggest uh, uh, against uh, communities that um, as an uh, the powers that be yeah. think might be difficult. Yeah. There was a book written uh, recently uh, by Chris Hedges uh, uh, called The Day of Revolt. And it's, uh, show, it talks about what he calls in the book uh, various sacrifice zones around the country. Uh, and the ones he documented in the book were Camden, New Jersey, an uh, 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 urban city of predominantly African American, uh, the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, the state of West, the entire state of West Virginia, uh, and the Immokalee uh, area of uh, Southern Florida. Um, and I, you could probably include in that with Detroit, Michigan now. Um, but basically, this is what he talks about in the book is the what's happening, the, the extreme poverty and and and. Um, horrible uh, living conditions in these areas is a direct result of economic policies uh, that have uh, uh, particularly affected these areas in, in particular. Uh, and uh, what's going on in Detroit is um, a good case in point where they're trying to make the city pay back uh, all these uh, um, loan scams that uh, came out of uh, places like Goldman Sachs that were sold to these cities that got became indebted and on top of that they're trying to privatize uh, the city water supply by raising rates and uh, I mean it's just it's a horrible it's a war zone situation uh, and you know Detroit also falls into the other economic policy that's been going on for some you know 30 years now is deindustrialization uh, not to say that there's less industrialization going on it's just that it's being done uh, across the world and uh, mainly Asia uh, and some parts of Latin America for wages a tenth of what they were being paid here uh, again the economics come back into play uh, and this is what's happening Happening, and this is what's going to continue to happen unless we stop it. Right as we speak now, President Obama and certain Democrats and Republicans in the House and the Senate uh, are trying to pass uh, through the tr uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, where mm -hmm. if that bill becomes law, we are not only going to be seeing a further decrease in our standard of living down to third world levels, but our democracy will be even more infringed upon than it already has been. Uh, you know, a recent interesting point was uh, on the Apache Reservation uh, in Arizona, the San Carlos Reservation. Uh, Reservation. The federal government used the National Defense Authorization Act that was passed supposedly to protect us from terrorists to seize some of their land for an Australian mining firm. So, I mean, this is what's going on, and it needs to stop, and we have to stop it. Nonviolently, but we have to stop it, or it won't stop. Believe on that me. topic, I think it's important. One of the, you mentioned Chris Hedges, and one of the things that comes out in his film Obey. <clears throat> is how we have so many issues, so many concerns. There's so much happening now. And we do have groups rising up to oppose the oppression. The problem is we need to converge. We need to start uniting. That's the only way. I mean, the old saying, uh, you know, 
united we stand, divided we fall, is very, very much in play. So I'm hoping that a lot of what we're seeing happening uh, is that uh, young people, uh, especially a lot of them that have been very active in the uh, Ferguson and New York uh, City, will come together and continue, continue the battles. Once, once one battle is won, we don't give up and quit and go away. And I think that's the point of being unaware here is that for years you've been drawing the, the lines between the dots, okay? In other words, the issues, and they are connected. So much is happening. So yeah, I, final comment from me. Mm -hmm. I think the incident at Centennial High School was more educative in a true mm -hmm. and deep sense for those students and yes. indeed for the whole school yes. than at least 20 hours spent in classes. Right. Yeah, one right. of the students actually said that last mm -hmm. night was, mm -hmm. I learned so much from this, this one event that um, I, I didn't learn the whole day in school, so yeah. Well, yep. Norm, Norm Chomsky has often said that as well, that it, you have to get out there and talk to people and become active. It's not just, you can't just sit back and just read. You have to get out there and talk to them. But one of the barriers to get everybody get, being out on the street and, and even Ferguson is that uh, people do have jobs. Well, yes. <laughs> and they actually true. have and that's, to, it's, it's and you that's know, another concern. Paycheck to paycheck that they're living. That's right. And, and, and that's one other way that <coughs> we're keeping people down. That's a form of slavery. You have to have three jobs. Right. It's in a order form to of slavery to keep people in debt. And that's what's happened to so many uh, young people. And as keep well. them off the street right. to demonstrate against you. I think it's also worth mentioning that this, uh, the question of war at home and abroad, which is really what we've been talking about all evening mm -hmm. here, uh, is not a sort of left-right uh, distinction in the forms that American politics mm -hmm. takes. And American politics plays a sort of game between yeah. uh, uh, one party and the other and suggests that what we have here is uh, the uh, uh, real debate that accounts for politics. Um, I'm brought to that uh, observation with one specific event from this last week that is a resolution passed by the House of Representatives in which the government's uh, military and economic policies uh, center on Europe and indeed center on Russia. Uh, and a comment from a uh, figure from the right, as he's usually seen in American politics, Patrick Buchanan, uh, he wrote this week, hopefully Russians realize that our house, uh, Russians realize that our House of Representatives often passes thunderous resolutions to pander to special interests, which have no bearing on the thinker or, or actions of the U.S. government. I'm not sure he's right about that last comment, but he does point out uh, the peculiarities of this resolution passed by the House last week by a vote of 411 to 10. As ex-representative Ron Paul writes, House Resolution 758 is so full of propaganda that it rivals the rhetoric from the chilliest era of the Cold War. H.R. 758 is a Russo Russophobic rant full of falsehoods and steep and superpower hypocrisy. And this is from both parties, eh? Right. And the critique here comes from, as I say, uh, someone on the, or figures on the political right. This is not the left complaining about uh, uh, what, is, what is being done, because the policy that's being complained about, the provocation of Russia, economically and politically, is the policy of the Obama administration <coughs> and of the Congress. Uh, for example, in the Congressional Revolu Resolution, uh, the uh, following statement is found. The Russian Federation invaded the Republic of Georgia in August 2008. Uh, Buchanan dismisses that with what used to be called the barnyard epithet. He says, on August 7th and 8th, 2008, Georgia invaded South Ossetia, a tiny province that had won its independence in the 1990s. Georgian artillery killed Russian peacekeepers and the Georgian army poured in. Only then did the Russian army enter South Ossetia and chase the Georgians back into their own country. The aggressor of the Russo-Georgia war was not Vladimir Putin, but President Mikhail Saakashvili. Brought to power in 2004 in one of those color-coded revolutions, we, we, that is the United States, engineered. The resolution in Congress last week condemns the presence of Russian troops in Abkhazia, which also broke from Georgia in the early 1990s, and Transnistria, which broke from Moldova. 
<coughs> but where is the evidence that the people of Transnistria, Abkhazia, or South Ossetia want to return to Moldova or, or Georgia? We seem to support every ethnic group that secedes from Russia, but no ethnic group that secedes from a successor state. This is rank Russophobia masquerading as democratic principle. What do the people of Crimea, Transnistria, Georgia, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Luhansk, or Donetsk want? Do we really know? Do we care? Mm. And what have the Russians done to support secessionist movements to compare with our 78th day bombing of Serbia to rip away her province of Kosovo, which, led both, which had been Serbian land before even we were a nation? H.R. 758 charges Russia with an invasion of Crimea. But there was no air, land, or sea invasion. The Russians were already there by treaty, and the re-annexation of Crimea, which had belonged to Russia since Catherine was great, was effected with no loss of life. Compare how Putin retrieved Crimea with the way Lincoln retrieved the seceded states of the Confederacy, a four-year war in which 620,000 Americans died. Russia is charged with using trade barriers to apply economic and political pressure and interfering in Ukraine's internal, affa internal affairs. That's almost comical. The U.S. imposed trade barriers and sanctions on Russia, Belarus, Iran, Cuba, Burma, Congo, Sudan, and a host of other nations. Economic sanctions are the first recourse of the American empire. And agendas like, the National Endow agendas like the National Endowment for Democracy and its subsidiaries, our NGOs and Cold War radios, RFE and Radio Liberty, exist to interfere in the internal affairs of countries whose regimes we dislike, with the end, game, with the end goal of regime, cha regime change. Was that not the State Department's Victoria Nuland, along with John McCain, prancing around Kiev, urging insurgents to overthrow the democratically elected government of Viktor Yanukovych? Was Nuland not caught boasting how the U.S. had invested $5 billion in the political reorientation of Ukraine and identifying whom we wanted as prime minister when Yanukovych was overthrown? H.R. 578 charges Russia with attacking Syria's Assad regime and providing it with weapons to use against the Syrian people. But Assad's principal enemies are the Al-Nusra Front, the Al-Qaeda Al affiliate, and ISIS. These are not only his enemies and Russia's enemies, but our enemies as well. And we ourselves have become de facto allies of Assad with our airstrikes against ISIS in Syria. And what is Russia doing for its ally in Damascus by arming it to resist ISIS secessionists that we're not doing for our ally in Baghdad, also under attack by the Islamic State? Have we not supported Kurdistan in its drive for autonomy? Have U.S. leaders not talked of a Kurdistan independent of Iraq? H.R. 758 calls the president of Russia an authoritarian authoritarian ruler of a corrupt regime that came to power through election fraud and rules by way of repre repression. Is this fair, just, or wise? After all, Putin was twice, has twice the approval rating in Russia, as President Obama does here, not to mention the approval rating of our Congress, which is minuscule. Damning Russian aggression, the House demands that the Russia get out of Crimea, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, and Transnistria, calls on Obama to end all military cooperation with Russia, impose visa bans, targeted asset freezes, sectoral sanctions, and send lethal defense articles, weapons, to Ukraine. This is a sort of ultimatum that led to Pearl Harbor. Why would a moral nation arm Ukraine to fight a longer and larger war with Russia that Kiev could not win, but that could end up costing the lives of tens of thousands uh, more Ukrainians? In fact, under U.S. encouragement, Ukraine has killed more people in Donbass, the eastern region of Ukraine, than Israel killed in Gaza. Those who produce this provocative resolution do not belong in charge of U.S. foreign policy, nor of America's nuclear arsenal. Now, this is not a leftist screed. This is Patrick Buchanan, right. a figure on the American political right, condemning the outrageous behavior 
by the Congress in foreign policy and the support, indeed, of the provocations of Russia coming from the Obama administration. Uh, we're in uh, serious trouble, folks. And I think the numbers of people, you, I think there were 10 congressmen. Uh, there were 10 people who did not support yes. the resolution. Ten. Evenly divided, five Democrats, five Republicans. Right. right. Ten, uh, the, the, the vote in Congress, the vote in the House, yes. was 411 right. to 10. Right. <laughs> that's, right. That's quite right. right. You're watching Aware on the Air. Uh, <clears throat> comment, final comments, ladies and gentlemen. We should um, uh, remind you that uh, uh, AWARE demonstrates uh, against the war policy of the U.S. government, uh, both the administration and Congress, and the bringing of the war home to American police departments. We demonstrate against this uh, on uh, every uh, on the first Saturday of every month in downtown Champaign. Uh, we had such a demonstration this past Saturday and it uh, was a uh, uh, good turnout under the circumstances. Uh, you're welcome to come join us if you want and uh, uh, demonstrate against the policies that our government is following. You've been watching Aware on the Air presented by members and friends of Aware the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, a local peace group, in the 50th week of 2014. Today is what the White House calls Terror Tuesday, the day each week when President Obama picks out some people to be murdered by drones or U.S. death squads, the Special Operations Command. The President's underlings, notably CIA Director John Brennan, compile a list of who should be executed, and the President then chooses from baseball cards who will die. We know this, by the way, because the uh, administration boasted about it in a roundabout way to, uh, the, uh, to New York Times reporters, and an account was given blindly, uh, that is, without uh, attribution, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the New York Times. Uh, the assassinations, which is what the Obama administration is doing, are carried out in secrecy. The administration doesn't release accounts of the people they kill but literally thousands of men, women, and children have been killed on Obama's order. And we know that only because the victims uh, talk about it and there are groups around the world who are collecting this information. Most Americans don't know that the U.S. is running this terrorist program. It's thoroughly unconstitutional and Obama should be impeached for it. Our show is produced and directed by Jason Liggett for Urbana Public Television, thanks to him also this program and others like it will be available on YouTube. And see the Facebook page for AWARE. Uh, some of the articles referred to by the panel tonight will be posted there. Happy birthday tomorrow to Kathy Kelly from uh, Voices of Creative Nonviolence in Chicago, one of the major activists uh, against the uh, war that the U.S. continues to carry on in the Middle East. Um, finally, AWARE honors those who reveal the crimes of the U.S. government, which the rest of the world knows about, but Americans don't. Manning, Assange, Snowden, and others who are being persecuted by the Obama administration. Now, this is Carl Esterbrook for Ron Zoke, Karen Evans-Levy, Stuart Levy, Karen Aram, David Johnson, David Green, and other members and friends of AWARE, saying in the words of the late Edward Murrow, good night and good luck. Thank you.